Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Carolyn Nandita, and I'll be presenting and discussing the management of prosthetic valves in pregnancy. The moderator for this session is Dr. Manisha. So I'll be going through the case presentation, what available data we have at this time, the current guidelines, what we did for our patient, and what the take-home messages are. Now, this is a story of a 28-year-old primary gravida from Chittu, who presented to us in early August at around 32 weeks of gestation. She complained of severe holocranial headache for three days. She was noted to be drowsy by her family. They also gave history of a trivial fall about a week back. She was on regular follow-up with her local hospital for anticoagulation for her mitral valve replacement, which had occurred about 10 years prior. On examination, we found that she was drowsy, but she was oriented. Her vital signs, including blood pressure, were normal. She was pale and had pitting pedal edema up to the knee. Her JVP was not elevated. Her pupils were equal and reactive and there were no deficits. She had a prosthetic valve click, which was audible on auscultation and there were no added sounds at the lung basis. She had a gravid uterus at 32 weeks with a good fetal heart rate. At this juncture, the differentials that we considered included extradural slash subdural hemorrhage, or an intracranial hemorrhage in the view of her being on therapeutic anticoagulation, the other differentials of her cerebral venous thrombosis or a hypertensive encephalopathy were considered less likely. On proceeding with her imaging, it showed bilateral subacute frontoparietal subdural hematomas with sulcal arachnoid hemorrhage. There was no mass shift or midline shift seen. Her blood investigation showed that her coagulation parameters were deranged with a prolonged PT of more than two minutes and an INR of more than 10. As she was uh, uh, and had undergone a uh, valve replacement about 10 years back, we went ahead and did an echo, which showed an increased mitral valve gradient, which could indicate a prosthetic valve dysfunction as well. On the left side, you can see the picture of a ball and cage valve, which is what was uh, in place for her. So the problems that we were facing were that this is a primary gravida, 32 weeks, who had presented to us with a major bleeding event, who was on therapeutic anticoagulation for a prosthetic mechanical valve, and who probably also had some amount of valve dysfunction. To give some background into the situation, pregnancy itself is a prothrombotic state. This is because there is a relative increase in fibrinogen, plasminogen activating inhibitors, clotting factors, von Willebrand factor, and there's a concomitant decrease in protein S activity. These hypercoagulable changes begin in early pregnancy and persist for at least 6 to 12 weeks postpartum. We have evidence from historical cohorts of women with mechanical valves, which have shown us that there's an increased risk of maternal cardiovascular events, obstetric morbidity, and fetal complications. Because of these risks, they require rigorous control of their anticoagulation. And unfortunately, during this time, because of increased renal clearance and volume of distribution associated with pregnancy, this becomes difficult as well. So because of these risks, they are at a time in their lives when they need uh, adequate anticoagulation, but at the same time, and they're at the highest risk of complications of mechanical valves, as well as it's difficult to maintain adequate anticoagulation. So while caring for these women, it is really like walking a tightrope. We have to strive for a balance between the maternal risk of valve thrombosis, systemic thromboembolism, and hemorrhage with the fetal risk of exposure to oral vitamin K antagonists. So to have some data to go along with that background, we have the European Registry on Pregnancy and Heart Disease, which was initiated by the European Society of Cardiology. They had recruited 1,321 consecutive women with structural heart disease from 60 hospitals in 28 countries. They found that the chance of an event-free pregnancy with a live birth were only 58% for women with a mechanical well. That is about only one in every two pregnancies. At the same time, if you look at the risk of valve thrombosis, it occurred in about 5% of the pregnancies seen and the risk of mortality was one in five. They also saw hemorrhagic events in 23% of the patients with a mechanical heart valve. When you consider the options for anticoagulation in pregnancy, there are three main drugs that are used. Acunocumerol or warfarin, which is an oral anticoagulant, uh, low molecular weight heparin and unfractionated heparin. 
Now, aquinocumorol and warfarin both cross the placenta and transfer to breast milk. Our concern, therefore, is mainly with warfarin embryopathy. The other two options are injectable. Long-term application of both has been associated with osteoporosis. So what constitutes an effective regimen? There are three options that have come through of studies over the years. One is using oral anticoagulation throughout pregnancy and switching over to unfractionated heparin near term. The second option is during the period of 6 to 12 weeks to substitute warfarin with unfractionated heparin or enoxaparin. The third option being that we can use unfractionated heparin or enoxaparin throughout pregnancy. When you compare these regimens, this is a systematic review published in JAMA, which had looked at 28 articles, six cohort studies and 22 case series. Um, and they had looked at about 976 women with 1,234 pregnancies. These studies were conducted between the period of 1966 to 1997. When you consider the regimen which gave oral anticoagulation throughout, 6.4% of them experienced congenital anomalies. Whereas when you used an initial combination of heparin followed by anticoagulation, oral anticoagulation, there were no anomalies noted. The, this slide shows the amount, number and uh, incidence of thromboembolic complications. It is seen more frequently in the group which received heparin throughout about every third patient, whereas it was lowest in the group which received only oral anticoagulation. Thus, heparin usage during the first trimester will reduce the fetal risk, but is still associated with an adverse maternal outcome. Now, what about enoxaparin? When you look at enoxaparin, there are case series available. This is one which looked at about 76 pregnancies, and all these patients were treated with low molecular weight heparin throughout pregnancies. There were no congenital anomalies seen. However, one in five patients had a thromboembolic complication likely due to poor compliance and lack of monitoring. Despite this, there is still no evidence to suggest that it is inferior to any other form of anticoagulation with adequate monitoring. Now, does dose matter? This question comes into play when we're thinking about oral anticoagulation. With the data that we have seen before, we know that oral anticoagulation is highly effective, but the risk of warfarin embryopathy is what worries uh, many a physician. Now, when this study compared patient pregnant women who used a low dose warfarin versus a high dose warfarin, they found that at lower dose of warfarin, that is less than five milligrams, the risk of embryopathy is nearly nil. Now, when you choose a regimen, you need to keep in mind the risk of embryopathy at higher doses, the need for monitoring while using Clexane, and the fact that using heparin alone may not be effective. So it has to be an individualized decision in discussion with the patient, with the risk and benefit of each regimen being explained to them. This is a flowchart which shows the current guidelines published in 2018 by the European Society of Cardiology. So what they, have told, what they have shown is they've divided into two groups. One is women with a mechanical valve and low dose vitamin K antagonist, which is what we'll go through first. Uh, prior to pregnancy, they are encouraged to continue oral anticoagulation. When they do get pregnant in the first trimester, there are three options. One is that we continue the warfarin. Second, we can in hospital change to low molecular weight heparin twice daily with close monitoring or change to unfractionated heparin with close monitoring of the APTT. In the second and third trimester, you can switch over to uh, oral anticoagulation if you were previously using low molecular weight heparin, or you can uh, uh, or if you had already used oral anticoagulation, you would continue the same. So in the second and third trimester, it is uniformly to switch over to the uh, vitamin K antagonist. You will have to monitor INR at least two weekly. When you look at women with mechanical valves and who are using high dose vitamin K antagonists, that is more than five mg of warfarin per day, the options are even here in the first trimester, you can continue warfarin antagonist, warfarin, keeping in mind the higher risk of embryopathy or the options of unfractionate heparin, low molecular weight heparin with close monitoring. In the second and third trimester, 
um, it is more it, you can continue the anticoagulation, oral anticoagulation, or switch over to low molecular weight heparin in the second trimester. Now, when it comes to 36 weeks, um, in for all uh, for all these women, it is a uh, it is recommended universally. It's a class one recommendation that in hospital they change over to unfractionate heparin or low molecular weight heparin with monitoring. At 36 hours before delivery, they use unfractionated heparin monitoring APTT, which is stopped four to six hours before delivery and restarted four to six hours after delivery if there is no bleeding. So what do we do in our institution? So for our patients in the first trimester, they are given two options. One is warfarin, especially if the dosage is less than 5 mg per day or to use continuous IV heparin or dose-adjusted unfractionated or low molecular weight heparin, following up with warfarin in the second and third trimester up to 36 weeks. Similar to the guidelines at 36 weeks, they're all uh, the ones on oral anticoagulation are administered heparin or low molecular weight heparin after stopping warfarin. Bearing in mind that low molecular weight heparin can only be used if we are uh, monitoring factor 10A levels frequently. For our patient, as she had presented with a severe bleed, we had to under we had to do a reversal of anticoagulation. So we gave her four FFPs. You can use prothrombin complex concentrates if available. We administered intravenous vitamin K and we checked INR about six hours after administration. Now, once the repeat INR was in therapeutic range, we started on Clexane. She was delivered at 34 weeks by emergency C-section. She developed failure postoperatively, which was managed with diuretics. After she improved, her Clexane was overlapped with warfarin, and currently she's under follow-up with cardiology for further management. So the take-home messages are, one is the importance of perinatal counseling in a patient with a mechanical prosthetic valve the many risks of mechanical valves in pregnancy. Also to remember that oral anticoagulation with warfarin at low doses is safe in the first trimester. And to always bear in mind that the INR should be in the target range to reduce thromboembolic and hemorrhagic complications. Thank you.